Green Ridge, go ahead and stand with us this morning. Let's begin worshiping today. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing, but not. It was my turn till I met you. You called my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. You called my name. all that I know. The old maid knew Jesus when I met you. You called my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. Welcome to Greenridge Baptist Church this morning. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers in the house and watching on the live stream. Uh, psychologists for a long time have been agreeing with the Bible that fathers are one of the most uh, important people in a person's life. And so we thank you for what you've done, and we pray blessings over you today, that today is a good day for you. Here at Greenridge, we are exiles, exalting God and exerting good so our neighbors experience Jesus uh, last week was a big week for us. Eric Stishon and his wife Sarah were here. Eric uh, preached in view of a call, 
And today is another big day where uh, a ballot will be sent out to the membership of the church uh, on whether or not to call Eric to be our next youth pastor. So be looking for that in your email inbox. Look around in your inboxes. Sometimes the email floats to different places. Um, but please vote today on whether to call Eric. Um, and if you have difficulty finding that, let me know, and I'll, I'll try and make sure you get it. We're going to continue worshiping. Uh, to do that, let's get our hearts in a, in a position and a posture of worship. And so uh, I invite you to put your hands out like we've been doing over the last couple months. We're going to be saying the Lord's Prayer together. Maybe close your eyes, focus on who God is and what he has done for you, maybe over the last week. And then say this prayer to your God who cares about you and loves you and wants the best for you. Say this prayer with me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Church, let's sing this song together. Come, now is the time. Come, now is the time to work. Now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. Come. Every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come, now is the time to work. is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before. confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. Come,
Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. We were waiting without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt To reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross. For even in your suffering, you saw to the other side, knowing this was our salvation, Jesus for our sake you died.
I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Church, read this with me. This comes from Isaiah 64. Let's read it together. We have all become like one who is unclean. 
and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls upon your name, who rouses himself to take a hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have made us melt in the hand of our iniquities. But now, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Be not so terribly angry, O oh Lord, and remember not iniquity forever. Behold, please look, we are all your people. Lord God, we acknowledge you as our Father. On this Father's Day, you are the greatest of fathers. God, forgive us for how we have failed you. Pour your grace into our hearts and minds to know that we have your forgiveness without question in Jesus Christ. Help us to rejoice in that. Help us to feel that. Lord God, we pray that what we do today is pleasing to you, is good for our souls and makes you happy. God, we pray for Tim's message coming up that it would be piercing, that it would be true, that it would be meaningful and encouraging. Bless us today, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, church. We all lead busy lives, but if we could just stop everything and take a bird's eye view, a little higher, there. Now we can see the multitudes. We are fueled by a shared vision to bring the name of Christ to those who have yet to hear. So we move forward to extreme places, corners of the world that have no access to the gospel. We train missionaries, send them out together, and pray that God's grace be known. We help the hurting, comfort the dying, give hope to the displaced, and have seen thousands come to faith in Christ. We are able to do so much more together than if we were chasing this vision alone. This is our common effort, together. Everybody, would you join me as we pray for our missionaries scattered to the nations this morning? Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, with um, the sending and blessing of their home churches, the influence of moms and dads and grandparents and Sunday school teachers. Lord, this family of missionaries are still being educated, still being called, and still being sent this morning. Lord, we thank you for these men and women. Most of them are married. Some of them are single. But they are going, Lord, to the ends of the earth. And Jesus, we pray for your power to help them, to keep them safe, to protect them from the lies of the enemy. Lord, even this morning, wherever they are, help them to see fruit, the result of the gospel being scattered. Lord, to, the, to that end, we promise to do our part, to pray and to give and to send our own sons and daughters to the field. Lord, even pray this morning for someone who may be under these lights that God is calling to take the gospel to the nations. Lord, make them restless. Call them, convince them, squeeze their heart until they have said yes. Lord, thank you for our time together in God's word. Lord, help me. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's good to see you. And we have some friends who have come back after the, the long time away, been vaccinated. Welcome back. It's good to see you. I haven't gotten any taller while you've been gone, if, you, if you're measuring. I recently have been attacked by a squirrel and a cicada. So you can, I, I may have to go to counseling. Um, I've had a rough time in nature in the past couple of weeks. Um, I told my grandkids the other night about the attack of the squirrel, and they acted kind of bored. So that didn't go as well as I thought it was going to go. <laughs> um, happy Father's Day. I want to start with a baseball story this morning. Earlier this spring, I was in or at an Oreo game with my um, oldest brother, my brother Bob, and we don't have a chance to do that very often, so it was fun. And a, and a couple rows down from us, over to the right, this was still during the, where they had the seats sequestered, there was an older group of men for this afternoon game, and I say older, probably at least in their 70s, right? And they were enjoying the afternoon, and they obviously had been friends for a long time, and they're yakking it up and talking and laughing. 
And at one point in the game, our Orioles' young shortstop totally booted a routine ground ball and totally muffed the throw to first base. And then here's what the old guys said. One of the guys down below stood up and he yelled at the top of his lungs, come on, man, play your position. Mark Belanger could have made that play with his eyes closed. I looked at my brother Bob and laughed, and I said, that's true, but Freddie Galvis doesn't know who Mark Belanger was. Okay, that's the problem, all right? Freddie was only seven or eight years old when Mark Belanger, our eight-time Gold Glove winner, passed away. That moment at Camden Yards got me thinking about the way life just rushes forward, right? It, it, it waits for no man, someone once wrote. So there are always new faces, new voices, new leaders, new personalities, and yes, new shortstops who step into the light and demand attention. This morning, and as we continue our preaching series in the Gospel of Mark, there's a new, fresh, up-and-coming rabbi. Public ministry of Jesus has just started, maybe just a matter of weeks since he was in the wilderness, tempted by Satan. He's already the number one topic in local conversations among the population. No one has more hits in local social media than this new traveling preacher from Nazareth. In just chapter 1, if you have your Bibles, Mark chapter 1, take a note of verse 28. Mark says, at once his fame, Jesus' fame, spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. His fame was spreading fast. Chapter 1, verse 45 says, the leper went out and talked freely about his healing and spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town. It was in, he was in desolate places, and people were coming to him from every quarter, from every neighborhood. Rapidly spreading fame, attention increasing, people coming from all over the place to, to see this young rabbi, to hear him preach, to watch him do signs and wonders. But there probably were some older guys <laughs> seated in one of these villages, maybe sipping some Galilean wine, saying stuff like, yeah, but he's not going to make it. I mean, he's not going to last. His family doesn't produce rabbis. Come on, he's not a Moses or Joshua or Elijah. He'll come and go. Let me ask you this morning, most days of your life, if someone was watching your life and, mo and my life most days, would our lives indicate that we think Jesus is just sort of a passing celebrity or that he really is son of man, son of God who died on the cross for our sins? Is he sort of just interesting for us to watch and listen to a couple of times a month? Or is he the one who is deserving of our obedience and our devotion? This morning, come with me to Mark chapter 2 and chapter 3. We're going to focus on the last part of chapter 2, verses 18 to 27, and then the first part of chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. When you look at these three uh, sections, these 16 verses, the three little narratives, these three moments, tend to be best seen perhaps as one moment frozen in time. They really are three stories of conflict or controversy um, that Jesus had with the people in his culture like in immediate terms, maybe the way we think of how fast we text and we get a response. Now, I believe that these three stories here actually happened, that they were inspired to be put into the record, they've been protected by the Holy Spirit, and they happen just as they unfold here in the, in the paper. Now, remember, there is, a, there is an older group, there is an elite group, a guard, an older guard, guard of course, and they're, they're skeptical of this new flash-in-the-pan rabbi. And they don't really like the fact how he's captured the hearts and the minds of the people, the common people in the streets and villages. And maybe they would have preferred that he was just a summer celebrity, here today, gone tomorrow. But there was something about the tone of Jesus, his authority, his face, his voice, his eyes, his power that was unlike anyone they had ever seen or heard. And rather than getting bored and going on to the next new thing, the people in Galilee wanted to see and hear more of Jesus. And so should I. And so should you. The title of the message today is, Let's Watch and Remember How Jesus Loves Us and Serves Us. Let's be fascinated by this new face that appears at the beginning of the gospel. Let me suggest to you today three things about Jesus that ought to just 
grab our hearts and ought to just pump adrenaline into our souls as we celebrate Father's Day and head into Monday morning. Number one, Jesus invites us to the greatest celebration ever. Look at chapter 2, verse 18. Let me read that section for us. Chapter 2, starting at verse 18. Now, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And the people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Well, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins." This is a conflict about fasting. So let's remember what's going on in the Bible when we use the word and have the practice of fasting. Yes, fasting normally refers to refraining from food for a meal or a day or a week or a month. And normally it's an act of regret for sin and a a desire to really hear from the Lord, to, to refrain from some pleasure so we can really hear from the Lord. In the Old Testament, the Jews were only required to fast one day a year on the Day of Atonement, Leviticus 16.29. It was seen of a, as a day of, you know, regret for your sin and sort of uh, afflicting yourself, giving yourself some pain in order to show God how serious you were about your repentance. If you fast forward to the New Testament era, this era, the days of Jesus, the, the Pharisees kind of promoted a teaching that folks should voluntarily fast two days a week, not one day a year, two days a week, and the rabbis decided it was Monday and Thursday. It was sort of held up as a way of showing your piety, like if you're really a good Jew, like if you're really trying, you'll fast Monday and Thursday. Of course, the Pharisees wanted to have sort of a badge on the outside of their robe that kind of had a little calendar, right? I fasted yesterday, I'm fasting in two days. Here in Mark 2, some of John the Baptist's disciples and the Pharisees were openly fasting. It was obvious that they were fasting. They wanted people to catch them fasting. And they had a conversation with Jesus about his disciples, and they asked him directly in chapter 2, verse 13, why don't your disciples fast? Like, this is a religious thing that you sh- your guys should be doing. Well, the truth is, maybe they were fasting, just doing it privately. We don't always know when each other is praying and fasting, do we? But in response to this moment of conflict and controversy with the religious elite of his day, he takes a breath and he invites anyone who is listening to the greatest celebration ever. Look at verse 19. Can the wedding guest fast while the bridegroom is still with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. I don't think he's criticizing fasting, but he does turn the conversation from conflict and controversy to this invitation, which is phenomenal. It's wonderful. It's exhilarating. He uses an illustration from life, from earth, that all of us understand, doesn't he? The gathering of two families, when a young man and a young lady are getting married, there's a beautiful bride at a wedding, and there's a handsome groom, right? And and she's there with her attendants, and he's there with his groomsmen. And before before the engaged couple are able to express their affection and vows for one another in front of the rabbi and in front of God, their parents are already there. The the wedding guests have arrived, and they're in their, their best digs, their best dress. There's a crowd of folks, right, all dressed up, anticipating the ceremony. They want to watch and listen to how the bride and the groom say what they want to say to each other. They're looking forward to the kiss and the party, the meal, the laughter, the dancing, the hours of fellowship and celebration. Jesus says, there's no fasting at a wedding while the bridal party is still there. I mean, no one fasts at a wedding reception. That looks kind of silly, right? Everyone wants to be where the bride and groom are. 
where the romance is, where the love is, where the party is, where the celebration of the love story is. Uh, As he always did, Jesus is talking about earthly brothers and sisters getting married. But he's also alluding to the most attractive paradigm about our salvation that we can imagine. He is alluding to the fact that by grace through faith, believers are married to Christ. That he is the bridegroom, and we, the church, are his beloved bride. And by his act of courting us, of stooping down and pursuing us and loving us and giving an extravagant amount of affection to us, he invites us to the greatest celebration ever. He invites us to leave our sin and our darkness and the path we're on to hell. He invites us to leave that and to sit with him at his table in heaven. Praise God. Amen. Do you remember the words of Jesus that John heard in Revelation 19, verse 6? 19.6. John says, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, the, the roar of many waters and the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us re- rejoice and exalt and give Him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted to the bride to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, John, bro, write this down. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Praise God. You know, sometimes you and I get invited to weddings. Sometimes we don't. And if we're honest, sometimes we get our feelings hurt a little bit. Like, why did he get to go and I didn't get to go? But this wedding celebration, this one, the disciple John heard about and witnessed, it is the greatest celebration ever. And by grace through faith, just through what the Father has done through this wonderful, precious Savior, we are invited to be together with all the saints dressed in the righteousness that Jesus has put on us. Our robes have been bought with the blood of Christ, and we are seated with our bridegroom, Jesus, forever and ever and ever at the wedding feast. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Jesus turns that moment of controversy to a moment of celebration. Look with me at the end of Mark chapter 2, verses 23 to 28. The second thing I would lift up about how wonderful and extravagant our Jesus is, is that He responds to our daily needs with His mercy and love. Let me read starting in verse 23, Mark 2, 23. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. Think there about how it looks when you and I nibble on peanuts or popcorn, okay? And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are, you, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry and those who were with him? how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the priest, and he ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and he also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, or Master, even of the Sabbath. So after being drawn into that conflict about fasting, Now, the second story of conflict, he's drawn into a conflict about what you can and cannot do on the Sabbath. Now, then and now, the Sabbath is a big deal to people in Judaism. Some would say it is the most public thing that Jews ever do all over the world once a week. This marks them as Jews. Well, the Lord gave Moses the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, and every Sabbath since then, sundown Friday to sundown Saturday, Wherever Jews were gathered, they observed the Sabbath. That's almost 4,000 years. I think we can agree the Sabbath is a big deal to sons and daughters of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do you remember that commandment in Exodus 20? The fourth commandment says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath 
a day of rest, a day of worship to the Lord your God. On it you shall do no work. So here in Mark 2, in this story of conflict and controversy, Jesus and disciples are walking through some grain fields on a Sabbath. So if we have the clock right, it's probably a Saturday morning, Saturday lunchtime. Probably wheat fields in that part of the world. And as they walked, his friends began to pluck heads of grain, just pull off and rub it in their hands and nibble. In verse 24, the Pharisees, who always love to be the referee for everybody else, spoke to Jesus and complained about this public snack in the field. Verse 24, Lord, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Rather than focusing on the daily needs of these hungry men with Jesus, they saw Jesus' friends as lawbreakers. They saw what Jesus' disciples were doing as violating the, this incredible, noble, lofty value in Judaism of breaking the Sabbath. In particular, the laws the, the Old Testament and the rabbis put together about reaping and harvesting on the Sabbath. Now, I think the Lord had flexibility in His heart about this issue, right? But He still sees the moment of conflict and controversy about the Sabbath to stress His law of love and mercy. Parenthesis, every time you and I start to be judgmental and critical of somebody else's spiritual journey, may the Holy Spirit grab us by the top button and say, hold up, hold up. You have been treated with love and mercy, easy on policing other people. So he asked the Pharisees to remember the story in 1 Samuel 21. You should read that story later, 1 Samuel 21. David was out in the field with his followers, warriors, and they're hungry. And, and, and what he asks for indicates that they are really hungry. He asked the priest if he had any food on hand for the men or warriors traveling with him. They were out, not in Jerusalem, they were out beyond the capital city. And specifically in 1 Samuel 21, David says, could we just have five loaves of bread? And the priest says, well, you know, David, you know about this. The, the, the 12 loaves that are in the tabernacle on the table are kept here for seven days. And at the end of seven days, the only one who can eat the old bread are the priests, and then freshly hot baked bread is put back on the table. These are symbolic of the Lord's portion, the Lord's presence, the Lord's provision for His people. According to Leviticus 24, only the priest could eat the bread that David was asking for. Jesus reminds the Pharisees standing in the grain field, wondering why Jesus' disciples are snacking on grain. He said, let me remind you of the law of love, how we need to respond in love and mercy to people who are hungry, people who are in need. David asks the priest for some food, and, and, and the, the priest finally yields to this request in mercy. And then in verse 27, Jesus said to those who were trying to criticize his friends, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man, referring to himself, is Lord even of the Sabbath. And I'm sure those words stunned and angered the Pharisees that he would be so bold, and they would say so arrogant, to get on top of that once-a-week pronouncement about Jewish commitment. By doing so, we're drawn to Jesus. We celebrate Jesus because He's showing us that His love and mercy are always greater than the demands and obligations of the law. Praise God. Hey, who do you know that's like Jesus in this regard? I mean, who do you know that never, ever fails to extend love and mercy to you regardless of the situation except Jesus? The gospel of the good news here is, is really good for all of us as sinners. It's really good for me and you, I believe, especially by some of us with our backgrounds where mom or dad or grandparents or somebody was always measuring us and penalizing us and criticizing us and, and demanding more of us to meet their expectations. If that's where you've come from, then you have a, a yoke of legalism on your shoulders. It's hard to lift off. This is good news. 
It's also good news for those of us who fall into the trap of acting and sounding like everybody else's spiritual umpire, right? Interesting how some of us, we always want to correct and punish and call out the the problem and the mistakes in other people's lives. It's good news for us, some of us who've been in church a long time, that we have a tendency, if not checked by the grace of God, that we want to be the measuring rod for other people. This is exhilarating. This is life-giving, what he says, that he is Lord of the Sabbath and that feeding his hungry friends, meeting their need, the law of love actually surpasses the law of the law. What a great word. He always responds to us with mercy and love. Let's look at the third story quickly, the third conflict story, which is in verses 1 through 6 of chapter 3. Chapter 3, 1 through 6. Again, he entered the synagogue, perhaps in Capernaum, we don't know. And a man was there with a withered hand, a shriveled hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. Notice this. Don't miss this. This tells us something about Jesus here. He looked around at them with anger, grieved at the hardness of their heart. The scholars tell us this is the only place in the New Testament where Jesus has anger identified like this. He said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. So this is another Sabbath, another religious conflict moment, right? Jesus is in the synagogue, that local place of gathering primarily for men. And Jesus notices a man with a withered or a shriveled hand. And so we don't know if it was um, a birth defect or something had damaged his hand. Uh, Some of the extra biblical evidence says that this man was a plasterer. It's not in the Bible, but that's that's a detail that may or may not be true. But if he was a plasterer for his job, that would tell us that something happened to his hand that, that damaged his hand. The Pharisees have gathered, and they're watching to see whether Jesus is going to heal this man on the Sabbath. Maybe they knew this guy. Maybe this guy came to synagogue every Saturday. But they're watching Jesus to, say, to see if he heals this guy who comes every so often to church, then we got him. We can accuse him again of breaking the law of Moses. The rabbis allowed healing on the Sabbath, but only if it was life and death, only if it was a terrible danger involved. So if we don't think a withered hand is life and death, so this brother would have to just wait till tomorrow or wait till the next Sabbath for Jesus to heal him. Mark 3.3 says that in the text that Jesus said to the man with the withered hand, come here. Literally, the text there says, get in the middle. Now, remember, a synagogue most often had chairs or benches along the outside walls, and the rabbi and the worship leaders would stand in the middle. So Jesus is asking this man with this withered hand to come stand in the middle, to be in public, to take a step of faith in front of a crowd of his peers. He asks the man who needs his hand restored to come and stand in this visible place where every eye would see him. And as the man moves toward Jesus, he turns his attention to the Pharisees, and we have that strong rebuke in verse 4, hey guys. As my friend comes to the middle of the room, just got to ask you a question based on everything that Yahweh has said in the Old Testament. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? Is it lawful to save life or to kill? Well, that's a cut to the heart question, isn't it? Yes, working on the Sabbath was prohibited. The Pharisees had that right. God was serious about it. Six days we shall work, and then we shall rest on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a holy day, and the Lord, you shall do no work on the Sabbath. God is really serious about that. But we also have the rhythm of life, right? We have sick children. We have trips to the ER. We have heart attacks and seizures and and crime and violence and traffic accidents. 
Is it acceptable to our Heavenly Father for us to act to do good and to save life? And the answer is yes. That's the law of love. Or do we have to tell the person in need, sorry, you got to wait till tomorrow. I know you're bleeding, but you got to wait till tomorrow. Jesus was checking on their hearts and their values, right? Listen, friends, He is always willing to use His compassionate power to restore what is broken in our lives. So after grieving their arrogant silence and their anger, He really has a grief moment about their anger, about their, about their hard hearts. He just says to this man with the withered hand, very simply, stretch out your hand. Now remember, this is in the middle of a synagogue, and we don't know how many people are there, but we could assume maybe dozens of men. There are plural Pharisees. There's at least two, probably more. And they're wanting to discover, can Jesus be charged with a crime? When the man stretched out his hand, Mark says very simply at the end of verse 5, his hand was restored. The man left the synagogue that day, think of this, with the full use of both hands. We don't know how long he's had the problem, but even if he's had the problem only a week or a month or a year, he went home with the use of both hands. He could put both of his arms around his wife. He could lift his children with both of his hands. He could feed himself and cut firewood. He could do lots of things with both hands for the first time in a long time. We praise Jesus for how he loves even the withered, broken parts of our lives. Amen? His compassionate power restored it, fixed it, healed what was broken in this man's life. And he did it on a Sabbath because he knew intimately with his father that his father was about saving lives and doing good. You know, friends, sometimes we need the Lord to restore our withered hands and feet. Sometimes we've actually prayed for people about that. We literally believe that we should pray in Jesus' name and ask for hands and feet and legs to be healed. Amen. Sometimes we need the Lord to restore our broken relationships, our broken marriages, things that are broken with our siblings. I have one of those that's broken with one of my siblings, praying that the Lord will restore that. Sometimes we need the Lord to restore our broken conduct, our broken character. Like we have a habit or a lifestyle or a choice that, that's broken and withered and it doesn't honor Him, and that needs to be fixed and healed and restored. During my ministry at Green Ridge, I've seen the Lord use His compassionate power through the prayers of His people. And this is not exaggerating. He has restored people who had terrible addictions. He has rescued marriages from divorce. He's brought home wayward kids. He's brought home wayward dads. He's healed people of cancers. He's provided financial miracles. He's even provided organs for transplants. Praise God. Amen. He is the one whose compassionate power restores what is withered and broken inside of us. He's not just a flash in the pan, summer new rabbi that just sort of bebops through Galilee and seizes the day for a few weeks and then goes off somewhere else forgotten. No, he is the one, the only one, who invites us to this heavenly celebration, the greatest celebration ever. He responds to our daily needs with his mercy and love, and he is able to restore what is broken in our lives. What a great Savior worthy of our attention and affection and devotion and obedience and commitment, hour after hour, day after day, week after week. We praise God for Him. We lean in and listen. We read His Word. We talk to Him in prayer. We follow Him closely. We learn from other brothers and sisters. We stay under the teaching and preaching of the Word. We get ourselves in groups where brothers and sisters can encourage us. We want to follow this one because He is so wonderful and magnificent and helpful to the biggest needs of our lives. Amen. I made a visit recently to someone who's in jail and um, read some scripture, did a little teaching through the glass, and then said, you know, uh, friend, I can't change 
what may await you in our court system. But I can tell you that while you're here, the greatest need of your life is to know, love, and follow Jesus. Please, know, love, and follow Jesus. Trust him. Follow him. Put your life in his hands. For he is worthy of all of our worship and praise. Amen? Let's pray together. Lord, we're already convinced that you're not just a flash in the pan, minor league shortstop rabbi that's been called up for the summer. You're not just the latest and greatest thing that people are talking, yakking, and typing about. There's no one, Jesus, like you. There's no one like you. Lord, give us, give me grace, insight to give up on the toys and the distractions and the, the sin of this world to understand you're worth following. There's no one like you. You deserve our best. Lord, may we give you that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, a few announcements for you before we uh, are done today. I want to encourage you to continue to tithe. Um, this is more than just a means of keeping things running at the church. Uh, it's also a spiritual uh, discipline that God has called his people to. And in fact, as you read through the Bible, it's a discipline that God has called his people to for thousands of years, in fact. It trains our hearts to be generous. It trains our hearts to uh, reject greed. It's a good practice for us. Uh-oh, one more. There we go. Uh, the next one is sign up to serve. We did this last week where we asked you guys, encouraged you, if you're interested in signing up for children's ministry, there, uh, Sue Overby was out there last week. She's going to be out there again. If you're still thinking and praying about serving in children's ministry and you want to make that commitment today, do that. There's another sign-up out there as well. Maybe children's ministry is not something that you're, uh, you're really excited about. Um, we also need people to be serving on the Connections team. This is folks like uh, parking lot helpers, coffee, greeters, ushers, and, there's one, uh, and then the connection desk people. If you're interested in doing something like that, if that is interesting to you and you think that you can serve God well in that, there are sign-ups out there. Carrie Tobin is out there. She can help you sign your name on that one. Uh, this is getting us ready for September 12th, the grand reopening, where uh, everything is back open, kids' ministries are happening, youth ministries are happening, everything is back up and running. And so we need your help to serve in those uh, ways. So uh, sign-ups out there, stop by on your way out the door. The next thing, like what I said earlier, there is a ballot today. It, is, it, it was in my inbox, and so I assume it will be in your inbox if you're a member of the church. So please look. Um, this is a ballot to affirm uh, calling Eric Stition to be the next youth pastor. So it's there. Please do that today. Um, if you have trouble finding it, let me know, and I will try and get it to you. And finally, uh, memorial service for Katie Gunzer is going to be this Saturday, at June 26th. Um, this is a family that was here at Green Ridge for a very long time. Uh, the kids did a lot of growing up here, and this is their mom. And so we want to serve this family well, and to do that, we need, a, we need some more help uh, to make everything happen. Uh, and so if you think that you would be able to help next Saturday... Uh, with this memorial service. Uh, we ask you to get in contact with Sandy Musgrove. Sandy's over there, wave. She's got the teal shirt on. So if you think you might be able to help, you can go talk to her this morning, or uh, you can email her, sandy underscore musgrove, comcast.net. Uh, if you can't remember that, you can email me. Uh, you can find my email on the website. Church, let me read a benediction over you. Go ahead and stand this morning. This is more of a call, uh, a call to obedience, a call to faithfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ. It comes from Micah chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. And uh, again, put your hands in a, in a posture of reception this morning, palms up. Just receive this word today. 
Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? The answer, of course, is no. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Church, go and do that this week. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.